so nice to be here back in Germany. I've been a couple of times before. Please forgive me that I don't have enough German in my, in my uh, vocabulary to do this presentation in German. It would be very short if I did. Um, so uh, I will try to speak fairly slowly, but I've noticed something about Germans. They're very good at English. And um, one, two of the nicest words that a speaker can ever hear before they speak is more, more chairs. And I heard those words tonight. So thank you for all for coming. It's nice to see such a big crowd in a small room that will get warmer as the evening goes along. When I was eight years old, I climbed into an aluminum rowboat with the elderly director of a summer camp north of Toronto where I grew up. He rowed us about a quarter mile out into the bay and we spent the next two hours fishing. I caught 16 fish that night. Uh, most of the little ones were thrown back into the water to go free, but some of the big ones were kept for breakfast the next morning. Mr. Nelson did all the dirty work, baiting the hooks with writhing earthworms and pulling them out of the fish's mouths and plunging his knife into the skulls of the fishes that were being kept. I was a sensitive kid with a soft spot for animals and a lot of what, what went on in that boat disturbed me. But this kindly man in the front didn't seem to think there was anything wrong and so I, I reasoned that it must be okay. I never took a shine to fishing. When it came time to bait my own hooks and pull them out of fish's mouths, I soon lost any interest. I just couldn't help seeing it from the fish's perspective. <laughs> that was 50 years ago, and in the ensuing time, we really haven't changed our view of fishes very much. We generally think of them as one of two contexts, a source of food or a source of recreation. I don't know about in Germany, but in the United States, fishing has such a benign image that it is seen as and used gratuitously as a symbol of all that's good about life and a, a nice way to spend a, a Sunday afternoon, for instance, provided you're not the fish. Tonight, I want to encourage you to see fishes through a different lens. I've spent the last four years swimming with fishes and researching about them and writing about them. Uh, culminating in this book, which is the U.S. version of the book that you have here, the U.K. edition, e European edition. And really, why did I write this book? Well, because we do have a very limited view of these creatures, these vertebrate animals. And as a scientist myself, an ethologist, one who studies animal behavior, I was aware of a fascinating science that shows these animals to be quite different than how we generally view them. And so I wanted to make this information, take it out of the scientific journals, make it accessible to non-scientists, to lay, lay readers and gen people in the general public. The first thing I want to try and impress upon you about fishes is how successful they are. We're really living in an age of, of fishes. Uh, we, we, we are mammals and we tend to be mammal focused, but really the greatest diversity of mammals was quite long past. And in the last few millions of years, fishes have actually flourished in terms of their numbers of species. They've diversified greatly. There are an estimate made 32,000, well, there's about 32,000 described species of, of fish, or fishes, as I prefer to say. Uh, there may be as many f as 40,000. Uh, new ones are being discovered all the time. And uh, I need to point out that there's two major groups of fishes. There's the bony fishes, the teleosts, of which pretty much everyone here is a member. And then there's the cartilaginous fishes, the chondrichthians, the sharks and rays, which number perhaps 1,500 or so species. These ones are the remaining 31,000 or so. And as you may expect, with such diversity, we have a great range of uh, shapes and sizes, uh, ranging from a tiny little Philippine fish of, of lake, freshwater lakes, uh, this species of which you can put um, a 10 euro coin on one side of a scale, uh, no, sorry, a 10 cent coin on one side of a scale, and uh, 300 of these fishes on the other, and the coin will go down. So they're very tiny and very light. All the way up to um, an ocean sunfish who may live for a century and gain in size from a tiny egg to a 100 year old, one and a half ton adult uh, by 60 million times. And then we have other superlatives among fishes. Just a few months ago, it was discovered based on an analysis of the eyes, the corneal layers of the eyes of Greenland sharks who were unfortunately caught by fishermen in Arctic waters that uh, they are, live to about 400 years, some of them. And they may be uh, 100 years old before they reach sexual maturity. This is a new record among vertebrates for longevity. 
Also true to their diversity is a huge range of shapes and colors. And some of the people who've named fishes, I think, deserve recognition for their work. I don't know who they were, but I want to share a few fish names with, with you. Uh, I think clown triggerfish is quite a, a suitable name for this. I have no idea what that sounds like in German, but hopefully it means something when I say it. I'm not so sure about being called a sarcastic fringe head. That wouldn't be my favorite, <laughs> favorite name. And you wouldn't want to call your aunt a hairy-jawed sack mouth. This is one of the deep sea angler fishes, and I will return to those momentarily. The longest fish name that I'm aware of is the Hawaiian Picasso triggerfish, known to the locals as Humu Humu Nuku Nuku Apua'a. <laughs> there will be a test on that before you leave the room today. Uh, that apparently translates to the fish who sews with a needle and uh, squeals like a pig, or maybe it grunts like a pig. For inadvertently rudest name goes to Helicaris bivitatus, a fish of the Atlantic seaboard, commonly known as the slippery dick. <laughs> Please forgive me. Perhaps my favorite name is the diagonal banded sweet lips. And I have to say, when I see pictures of these fishes, I always want to give them a big kiss. Mm -hmm. They do have quite sweet lips. I think you'd agree. Mm -hmm. Some fishes have to go through some dramatic changes during what must be a rather awkward adolescence. The uh, flatfishes or flounders have one eye actually migrate from one side of the head to the other. I was actually interviewed on the radio, and the host said, so what happens? It, it pops through from one side to the other? <laughs> no, it actually moves, sometimes as quickly as five days. A very useful adaptation. It makes you look a little weird, but it's a very useful adaptation to have the uh, binocular vision, which is very handy for uh, preying on prey who swims over top, and you have this camouflaged body. These flounders also are remarkable at changing colors to match their background. Some fishes don't even have fins. There's about 40 known species of toad fishes, which are in the anglerfish family, and you can see they have stumpy legs with feet and not fins, and they walk around on the bottom and they're stealth predators. They gulp open their mouths to catch fishes who swim too near. And uh, they also, as you can see here, are very well camouflaged. They can blend in very well to the surrounding corals and other rocks and shapes and things in their way. Back to the deep sea angler fishes. This is a, a photo of one of them. They're rarely seen. They live in the largest habitat on Earth. That's the deep ocean, the abyss, where the sun never penetrates. Uh, so it's dark all, all the time, 24-7. There is light down there, however. These fishes, and most fishes who live in that habitat, have uh, symbiotic bacteria who live in parts of their bodies. And they can make flashing lights, and they can signal uh, who they are. Uh, they can uh, use that to deceive others, to attract others, to um, maybe communicate in other ways. But there's something bizarre going on here. You may have noticed that these two uh, strange-looking um, things in the bottom here. These are two males. Um, what happens in deep sea anglerfish is if a male finds a female of the right species, and they, they determine that probably through a combination of her light flashes and uh, the smell, they have big nostrils, and also, um, well, maybe just uh, those are probably two, the two main senses that they use. And if they find a female of the right one, they, they latch onto her, they bite onto her body somewhere, it doesn't really matter, and that's it, they stay attached for the rest of their lives. Uh, they, their, their mouths become fused with her body, and uh, they actually share the bloodstream, and they can inseminate her intravenously. And you see two males here who have attached at some point. Scientists call this uh, sexual parasitism. I think it's a little bit of a negative uh, <laughs> expression, because really, for the fem from the female's perspective, if, if some male doesn't find and bite onto her, then her reproductive uh, life is a dead end, right? So it actually has some use to her. but. But for any, any radical feminists in the room, it, it is true that s some males do actually not amount to anything more than an appendage. <laughs> There's a lot that more that could be said about the diversity of fishes, but um, we don't have 32,000 hours here, so um, I'll move on into how fishes sense their world. Fishes probably invented the familiar senses to us vertebrate animals living on Earth. They probably also invented uh, color vision. Uh, they also have some senses that we don't have, including uh, on the bony fishes only, not the sharks and rays, although I'll come to those in a moment. They have a row of scales along the middle called the lateral line. It's a, a row that usually looks dark if you step back and look at the fish, and that's not because they're dark colored, but because these scales have a depression in the middle that casts a shadow. 
And within those depressions are a whole lot of little tiny little depressions with little gel cups and a little filament in the middle. And the filament is very sensitive to changes in water pressure and water movement. So it allows these animals to sense changes, subtle changes in the water around them, the way the water may be flowing or the presence of a rock or a large fish that you want to avoid. And particularly in the dark, it's a very useful adaptation. This is a blind cave fish who is blind, has no ability to see because uh, for generations generation after generation they've lived in dark caves where the light never penetrates and so it's it's no point in having eyes it's costly to build eyes and so they've lost that capacity that their ancestors had unless interestingly unless you raise them in the light it turns out if you raise the these kind of fish in lighted conditions, their eyes will develop uh, normally. So they have all of the genetic instructions for vision. It's just, if it's not needed, it's not expressed. And it's a nice illustration of the important role that the, in, the environment plays in the so-called phenotype, how we look as grown-ups. But these are also relevant to the lateral line because um, they've been shown in studies at uh, Oxford University that they learn to navigate their environments perfectly well in completely dark conditions, probably by use of the lateral line sensing objects in their path, and they can learn that within just a few hours. Sharks, the chondrichthians, don't have a lateral line, but they have a really special uh, sensory system that we don't have. It's called electroreception. They can sense electric fields in their environment. It's a very useful thing if your, if your prey is a little creature living, hiding under the sand, unfortunate for it, but uh, the shark may be able to detect perhaps the electric pulses given off by a heartbeat or something else that comes from being alive, and the shark can detect that and find that prey that way. So it's a very useful adaptation for them. Some fishes have taken electricity to a whole other level, though. They, they actually produce electric pulses themselves. Scientists call them EODs, or electric organ discharges and they may be pulsing at certain frequencies. These two knife fishes, named for their knife-like shape, are both, say, at 400 hertz in this case. That's a certain rate at which they're putting electric pulses out, very rapid. And then uh, when they're swimming by each other, it may get a little confusing with two individuals with the same frequency, so they'll, they'll readily change their own frequency to avoid kind of confusion and jamming of each other's signal. They're also known to do a number of other things, including um, if, if this one is the territory holder and this one's swimming by, this one will stop making EODs uh, so as to not disturb the uh, resident territory holder. So you might say that's an example of deference in fishes. The visual system of some fishes uh, goes into new terrains as well. These are amb amb ambon damsel fishes, and they're kind of yellow looking in, in visible light to us, which is actually quite good camouflage against the coral reefs where they live, where there's a lot of yellows in the environment. But under ultraviolet light, they have uh, face patterns. This is uh, two photos of the same individual fish, only this one is taken under ultraviolet light. And you can see there's this constellation of patterns on the face that uh, comes, becomes visible under UV light. And this is a way that these fishes can uh, recognize each other and identify each other that doesn't compromise their camouflage against other fishes that may want them for dinner. Can fishes recognize human faces? People who have fishes in aquariums have often claimed this, but only in recently have scientists actually asked the question. They asked uh, um, angler fishes to uh, see if they could identify faces, and even with removing fa uh, features like hair and ears, they actually can show that they can recognize faces. These are a particularly good species to use because they can squirt water, and they can, you can train them to squirt at one of two targets. And, uh, and to tell, essentially tell you, uh, this is the one who I recognize, this one I don't. And they presented them with a range of faces. You can design studies to do that. Fishes actually fall for optical illusions, the same ones that we do. So this is the Ebbinghaus illusion, in which the orange circle on the right looks bigger than the one on the left, even though they're, they're exactly the same size. It's just because of the arrangement of blue circles around this one that it looks larger. And if you train fishes to select their preference for a larger of two circles by, say, giving them food each time they do that, they will, when presented here, they will choose this one. The muller lyre illusion, which is this one, this is the, this, these two lines are the same length, but this one looks longer because of the arrowheads. Um, if you've trained red tail split fins, for instance, to select, uh, to favor a longer of two lines, they will choose this one when presented with these. 
fishes like bamboo sharks will also indicate that they recognize a triangle in this image. This is the Kinesa triangle in which there's actually no triangle present in the literal sense. It's just by the arrangement of these figures, the black shapes, that it looks like there's a white triangle here. And uh, these fishes will indicate that they, they see a triangle there, they perceive a triangle. I think there's something important about that, something poignant. It, it's, it says that a fish can perceive the world the way we do. It says that they can have beliefs. They can actually believe there's a triangle there. Um, and it says something about their fallibility, that they can be wrong about something they think is true. And indeed, animals often deceive each other, and they, they use the fallibility of others to exploit them that way. I think it's worth pointing out, because it's kind of something we, we see in ourselves. Are fish cognitive? Do they think? Do they have minds? We know they have brains. And it turns out they can use their brains to do pretty clever things. Uh, tool use is one example. Tool use is something that for a long time we thought only humans could do. But in fact, um, it's been found in all sorts of animals now. And fishes, there's good examples as well. So this is a tusk fish who has used water as a tool to uncover a buried clam in the sand. It could have been several hundred meters away. And then the tusk fish picks up the clam, carries it to the particular rock, and uses the rock as an anvil. Uh, in my book, I describe this not only as tool use, but as planning, because it indicates a sequential uh, set of steps to get to that point. And it's pretty clear from the deliberateness of the behavior that the fish knew all along what he or she was planning to do in doing this. And note that there's bystanders, or perhaps we should say by swimmers, who are keeping an eye on the action, looking for an opportunity to have some for themselves. Incidentally, you can watch a YouTube video of this behavior. And the fish, uh, this is not the same individual in the video, but the fish, uh, you might think they blow water with their mouth, and often fishes do that. But the, the one in the video actually turns away and closes the operculum, that's the gill cover, and creates a puff of water like that to move the sand. A little bit like taking a book and closing the book rapidly creates a puff of, a puff of air. So fishes may be what we would say idiosyncratic. They may have individually different ways of doing these behaviors. Back to the archer fishes and uh, an interesting behavior them. So let me just explain what they do here. They usually feed underwater, but if an insect flies by, they, they are very good at squirting water and catching insect prey by squirting a jet of water. They control the size of the bolus according to how big the insect is. And, um, they actually are known to learn by observation. So these two young ones may be not very good at doing this because they haven't tried it before. But just by watching hundreds of times uh, experienced adults do it, they become quite good at doing it themselves. That's called observational learning. We could add that it's taking the perspective of another individual. We celebrate the intelligence of uh, chimpanzees, our close relatives that, for instance, are recognizing, remembering the location of a random array of numbers on a computer screen that's displayed just for a few fractions of a second. And they can remember those numbers in order much better than we can do. But we generally look at fishes as having very poor memories and not being able to remember much at all. In fact, that's not the case. They have excellent memories. This is a, an example here. This is a frilfin goby who maybe deserves a, an Olympic medal for fish memory. They live in habitats like this, intertidal zones where the water comes in and out. And uh, at low tide, they're in these pools. And if uh, an octopus comes along or a big fish who wants to eat them, they are able to escape by jumping to neighboring pools. And the question is, how do they know which direction to jump? And how do they know how far to go? And in fact, a series of experiments done in New York City, not exactly their home habitat, um, found that they have a remarkable skill to memorize and learn the topography of these tidal zones at high tide when the water comes in. So the water comes over, they swim over that area, and they memorize where all these pools are so that when they're in the pools at low tide, they can jump in the right direction and avoid being on the rocks and dying. Scientists call that a mental map. So you're sort of forming a mental map. We are good at mental maps. Uh, if I blindfolded you and took you at your, to your front door and said, go get your toothbrush, you'd probably knock a few things down and bump yourself a couple of times. But you'd find your way to your toothbrush, because you know that map of your house. If you went to a, someone else's house, it would take a lot longer, and it would be trial and error. Uh, so similarly, these guys can learn to, and memorize their home habitat. There's a lot more that can be said about how fishes think, but in the course of a, a five-hour lecture, I simply don't have time to do that. Don't worry. It's not more than four. 
What does a fish feel? Do they feel pain? Can they feel pleasure? Can they be afraid of things? Can they be angry? Do they have personalities? Do they have emotions? Uh, pain is something that uh, it's, quite, it's been known for quite a while through physiological studies uh, in jargon-filled texts like this that I don't force my readers to read, uh, that, uh, that fishes can actually, that they have all the right equipment to feel pain. And a series of studies done on various species is really, there should be no further debate about fish pain. They are full members of the vertebrate group. They have the full suite of 10 body systems that we have. They have keen senses, as if you've seen. We sh they can move away from bad things. We should expect they can feel pain. And studies by Victoria Braithwaite described in her book, Do Fish Feel Pain, published in 2010, using trout, show that they have different sensory receptors, pain receptors, nociceptors for chemical, uh, heat, and mechanical pain, just as we do. They send those signals to the brain. The fish learns from that, changes behavior, avoids painful stimuli, and also will seek out pain relief if given the opportunity. Uh, to that end, a study by Lynn Snedden, another British biologist, uh, shows quite convincingly that fishes will seek pain relief, uh, that they feel pain, and they will take steps and even pay a cost to relieve their pain. In this case, the fishes were kept in a complex tank that had two chambers. One chamber was the enriched chamber that had rocks and vegetation and dim light and places to hide. That's a place fishes like to be. The other chamber they could swim over was barren, empty, brightly lit. They never spent any time there. All 30 fish spent all their time in the, in the stimulating, nice, or sorry, the, the, the safe habitat. And it continued to be the case after they injected them either with saline solution, which is probably doesn't last, have any lasting pain, or acid, which causes lasting pain. They all still stayed in the safe, preferred side of the tank until they dissolved a lidocaine, a pain relief, a pain killer, in the undesirable side of the tank, the one that was brightly lit. And some of the fishes began swimming over to that side of the tank. And it was only the individuals who'd received the acid injection, the ones who were in pain. Uh, so they realized they could relieve their pain by going over there. And they went over there and they paid a price, they paid a cost, they went to swim in a part that they would normally avoid to relieve their pain. I think it's a very compelling and convincing demonstration of pain. It's been done with chickens, it's been done with rats, and I think pigs and some other species. And we're more ready to accept that in those animals, but the evidence is just as strong in fishes as well. We may argue where we draw the line on sentience, the capacity to feel, you know, who feels and who doesn't. Um, it's pretty clear that all vertebrates are sentient. And now there's growing evidence that invertebrates, uh, some invertebrates at least, are sentient. Cephalopod mollusks, the octopuses, which are the new darlings of, of cognitive research, and uh, there's a lot of books coming out about them. Very exciting stuff. Uh, they're invertebrates, but they, they have consciousness, they have personalities, they can hold grudges, they remember things, they're very good escape artists. They're clearly um, able to feel things, and they show their emotions by changing color and squirting ink and this sort of thing. Snails, who knows? Uh, but um, we should draw that line on sentience in pencil because as new in scientific information becomes available, we need to change where we think we put that line. A study of surgeon fishes showed that just as zebra fishes we just met will relieve pain, uh, will find a way to relieve pain. If you give them the opportunity, physical pain, they will seek ways to relieve uh, psychological pain, psychic pain, stress as we call it. How were they stressed? Not happy for these fishes. They were caught in the Great Barrier Reef and each fish was put in a bucket of water with just enough water to cover their body for 30 minutes. And you can measure stress by taking a blood sample and measuring cortisol, a stress hormone, and the cortisol levels went, went up very high in these fishes after they were put in the, in the bucket. And then they were taken out and each fish was given an opportunity to swim, into, swim in a tank, a regular tank, uh, with a wand. It had a wand that, that could either move or would be stationary. And the wand was painted to look like a little fish who gives massages to fishes on reefs. And I will come back to that in a, in a couple of hours. And uh, the fishes who could swim up to the stationary wand ignored it. They didn't swim anywhere near it. They just stayed stressed. 
the ones who had a moving wand in their tank, they swam up next to it and they got stroked. They got strokes from this wand. So, um, and their stress levels came markedly down. So this is an example of stress relief of, by getting a massage, by getting a caress, by getting, you know, petting the dog or being petted by your friend. And um, I'm happy to say that all the fishes in the study were released back into their home habitat on the Great Barrier Reef after the study. So they all survived the study and all went home. I mention that because it's exceptional. Most scientists don't, don't, either don't do that at all, or if they do it, they don't even say that they did that in the, in the published paper. In our journal, Animal Sentience, which Mahi mentioned in his introduction, uh, we do encourage our, our authors, we say that they need to explain what happened to the animals if they used animals at all. And we, we encourage them not to harm animals, and we, we won't publish studies that are harmful. We think we can use ways to encourage them, to encourage animals with the rewards instead of uh, punishments. Nevertheless, studies of stress and pain, generally the scientists are causing those to the animals. A recent study from Norway found that some fishes on salmon farms become severely depressed. That was their phrase, severely depressed. Uh, this is a severely depressed salmon from a salmon farm. This is an aquaculture situation where there's crowded, crowded fishes in small tanks, and they have to live there swimming in circles. So it's probably a very boring existence. And uh, this is a one who is a, a normal, quote unquote, unstressed, probably very stressed, but nevertheless coping. But this one just couldn't cope. They're the same age, and very large numbers of these fishes stop feeding, and they uh, float to the surface, and they die. And you can measure their cortisol levels very high. So uh, the conclusion was they were severely depressed. And indeed, when you test animals on drugs that are for anti-anxiety or antidepressants on humans, they show, the fishes show similar types of behavioral changes. Many fishes are social. They live among each other. And by studying social behavior, we also get a window on some of the complexities of their lifestyles. I want to just share a little bit of that. I mentioned personalities earlier. Uh, this fish, this individual, shows this, I think, very nicely. This is a, a razor wrasse, who the photographer and diver Robert Wintner named Razor Boy because he came to know the fish. He would swim in this area of the reef all the time, and this fish was always there. And when he first swam there, the ra razor boy avoided him and was afraid of him because he was new. Uh, but it, in time, he saw that this guy was a nice guy, and maybe he even fed him occasionally. I don't know. But uh, razor boy became so friendly that, that uh, Robert had to push him away t so he could get a photograph with him uh, with a camera. So uh, almost too friendly. What about fish play? This isn't actually to do with society. I'm not sure why I have it in the society section. It should be on feeling, actually. But uh, there's now emerging evidence that fishes play. Uh, this supports the idea that fishes can, can be on board because play is often a way to relieve boredom. It's stimulating. It's something to do. These male cichlids, there were three in the study, they weren't, the scientists were not studying play behavior, but they noticed that the cichlids would interact with this semi-buoyant thermometer while they were alone in this tank. They would bounce it around. They would bump up against it. And one theory as to why it, they liked to do this was that the thermometer would bounce back. It would come back at them, but they could always dodge it and avoid it. And maybe that was kind of gratifying. They were winning the fight. And each male did it differently. They interacted in different ways. One of them would bump it at the top. One would bump it in the middle. Another one would push it into the corner and bully it there and this sort of thing. And so we now have the first published evidence for play in fishes. Can fishes form emotional attachments to their humans? Uh, humans certainly can to their, to their fishes. This is Mango, a nine-year-old puffer fish. That's the one on the left. <laughs> and uh, the, the human guardian would come home, and, and when Mango would see the human, the Mango would come to the tank and look excited to see her, and they would spend a long time in what she described as staring contests, but we're probably just, I'm, I'm really happy to see you. And uh, unfortunately, Mango lived alone because, well, he lives alone. As far as I know, he's still living. Puffer fishes are um, quite aggressive, and uh, they eat other fishes, so they're generally kept by themselves. Uh, I'm not advocating keeping fishes in tanks at all, but people do do that, and you definitely can s learn things about them from observing them. Anyone here heard of flatulent communication? Um, it turns out herrings fart to actually convey information. They release bubbles from their rear ends, and uh, they appear to do this in a democratic process of uh, taking a vote on whether it's time to uh, 
to change their behavior, do something else that may be getting late in the day, it's time to go to a darker part of the, the water column and, uh, and hang out there. So that's an interesting side of the fish social behaviors, democracy, but uh, in terms of communication, herrings actually use these gas bubbles as a means of uh, audible communication. I did a little cartoon on this just to illustrate the point. <laughs> And can fishes be virtuous? Can they be good to each other? Can they self-sacrifice? Well, it appears to be the case. A recent study of rabbit fishes, of which we see pairs from four different species here, show that when they forage, they forage in pairs. They feed among the corals on algae. And to do that, they need to put their heads down and poke around in there. It's a very vulnerable position when there could be a moray eel swimming along looking for dinner. So it really helps if you have a lookout which the other individual in the pair is doing, looking out for danger. And if danger comes, this one will signal, and they quickly hurry off to hide in the reef. Of course, they switch off. After a couple of minutes, this one uh, goes up and plays lookout while this one comes down. And here we have a, a rather poor quality photograph that nevertheless illustrates an amazing uh, communication, social aspect of some fish behavior, which is referential communication, also cooperation. This is a, a large grouper, a big chunky fish of the reef. And this grouper, right after this photo was taken, did a head shake, uh, a signal. It's an invitational signal to a moray eel to go hunting together. They're both predatory fishes. And uh, this one's hungry, and this one's hoping this one will be hungry. And if they're both in the mood, they swim off together. You can watch YouTube videos of this as well. It, it looks like something out of a Disney film. <laughs> And it's referential communication because the signal, this, this communicative or whole body shimmy, is referring to something that's going to happen at a different place and at a different time. So it's a, it's a communication signal uh, because the foraging happens elsewhere and it's going to be later on, maybe just a few minutes later on, but nevertheless later on. It's also not willy-nilly. I mean, this, this particular grouper probably knows this particular moray eel. And indeed, studies at Cambridge University, a Cambridge Captive studies where they had uh, laminated photographs of moray eels, and they, they, they could use pulleys and strings to make the moray eels come out at different times. Uh, they could make them more or less cooperative, and they found that the less cooperative ones, the next day the grouper would ignore that one and would favor the one who was more cooperative. So there's, there's a selection preferences for individuals who work together as a team better. And scientists who spend a lot of time with their scuba gear on watching these things have actually measured to, find, to show that when they hunt together, they're per capita success rate uh, is higher than if they hunt individually. So both individuals get more food when they're hunting together than if they hunt by themselves. By the way, the way it works is that this is like a ferret of the sea. I mean, it's a big fish, but very long and narrow. They can swim into those nooks and crannies to, to either catch or ferret out a fish who's hidden there. If the fish happens to escape the moray eel, well, you can know who's waiting out in the open water, another large predator. Another aspect of social behavior in fishes is courtship. And courtship is widespread in fishes. Some of it's quite elaborate. Here we have a male barred hamlet swimming circles around a female. It's a courting behavior. Another interesting flexible aspect of their biology is that they can change sex very quickly. So uh, this, could be, uh, this female could be a male a couple of days later, all without expensive surgery, by the way. And this could be a female. About one quarter of reef fishes can do this. About five or six years ago, a Japanese photographer was swimming uh, about 80 feet deep off the southern coast of Japan. And he found this remarkable circle and took some pictures uh, about six feet wide, maybe two meters wide. And um, it, no idea what, what was going on. And he set up a camera and found that it was a tiny little male pufferfish who spent hours swimming back and forth across the sand and making these beautiful patterns. Uh, they've discovered many since. But uh, this pufferfish was pre previously unknown to humans. And you can probably guess why the male's doing this. He's trying to attract a female. And uh, there he is there. And uh, if the female is impressed, suitably impressed by his handiwork, his artistry, uh, they will mate together. And uh, they, will, they will have their eggs here. And they will cover them with uh, pebbles and bits of shell. I don't know why it works. To me, it looks like a big advertisement that says, eggs, come and get them here. This is where you'll get find eggs, you predators. But it apparently works, because it's obviously evolved over you know, not hundreds of years, but probably tens of thousands of years. And it's what we would call a sexually selected trait. It's, it's selective, choosy um, females who have 
uh, tended to favor males who do nice artwork, and that leads to this kind of thing. It's, it's a fish version of a peacock's tail. Parenting is also practiced by quite a large number of fish species. Um, one of the most elaborate expressions of parenting is what's called mouth brooding, where males will open their mouths if there's danger and the young recognize the signal and they quickly swim inside. It looks a bit like vomiting in reverse. And uh, when the coast is clear, they uh, let the fish out, which looks like vomiting the right way around. And uh, then, then they carry on with their lives. And this can happen for weeks. And in some cases, males will hold the eggs in their mouths for weeks. And they don't eat them, and they don't eat any food during that time. In fact, they may take some food in and let the young ones uh, eat it just after they've hatched. So it, it, it also looks like virtuous behavior, self-sacrificial, giving up on food, starving for a long time. Do fish feel pleasure? I think I've already kind of made the case that they do with the study of stress and being stroked by the wand, the mechanical wand, but that was more to relieve a negative feeling than to get a positive feeling. But um, in fact, the wand in that study was made to look like a, a cleaner wrasse. Cleaner wrasses are remarkable little fishes who work as, a, as teams of two or three or four on reefs. And that what they do is they clean so-called client fishes of various species. There's well over 100 known species of client fish who will come up to get cleanings. And the clients know where the cleaners are. They have particular stations and probably have their favorites. And the cleaners uh, swim in and out of the mouths of the clients and through the gills and uh, they remove parasites from their bodies and uh, they remove algae and other undesirables. And it's a cooperative system, so the client actively solicits the cleaning, opens the mouth, the client cleaner fish swims in. There's no recorded case of a client ever eating a cleaner fish, even though the client could. They're bigger predatory fish often. It just doesn't sustain good business relations when you eat your business partner. <laughs> And they also go in and out of the gills where a lot of parasites will latch on. So it's a mutualism. It's a benefit to both parties. The cleaners get food, and the clients get a spa treatment and a, par a parasite removal service. So it's a classic um, symbiosis. And it's very complex. There's over 150 published papers about this very relationship. And uh, it's, it's act actually Machiavellian. It involves good and bad behavior. I'll just describe a little bit of that. For one thing, cl cleaners want to maintain good reputations because clients can go to different stations to get cleaned by different cleaner fishes, and they want them to come back to them. And so they try to maintain good relations and to impress the, the clients. One of the ways they do that is they take breaks from removing parasites, and they go and they, they stroke them with their fins. Hence the study of the using the wand. They use that behavior as a stimulus for the way a fish could find some pleasure and stress relief. And so that's probably a way that they curry favor with their clients. On the flip side, sometimes cleaners will not do such a good job. And one way that they do that is they, they do what's called mucus nipping. They take a little nip of that, of that mucus on the side, that slimy layer on the side of the client fish. Clients typically will jolt when that happens, and that sends a signal probably to the cleaners that you just did a bad thing and I'm aware of it. It also sends a signal to other clients in the queue that uh, watch out for these guys. They're not so, <laughs> so good today. Um, so, and, and in studies, careful studies show that clients who are watching, who are actually watching out, are forming, this is the term the scientists use, image scores, a cumulative rating, if you like, of the client. It's, it's like eBay ratings, right? Where people earn or lose their reputations based on the quality of the trading that they do on eBay. Are they reliable in sending the product? Are they reliable as cleaners? Do they mucus nip? And studies show that mucus nipping is more likely to happen if there's very few or no clients in the queue, presumably because you, you're not losing so much reputation. You're not damaging your reputation because no one's there to see. If there's a lot of clients nearby, oh, the cleaners are doing a great job cleaning carefully and doing their, doing their caresses, no mucus nipping. So it's truly a Machiavellian system. And it speaks to a level of awareness, a level of wherewithal, a level of consciousness, of social skill among these creatures that we typically would not attribute to a mammal, never mind a fish. And I'm not dissing mammals here. We, we've underestimated all the animals. And there are fishes in places where fishes are treated well, I mean, they're not typically spearfished or, or persecuted, where they will swim up to trusted divers to receive caresses from the dive divers, gentle strokes. Uh, this is like this um, 
this uh, NASA grouper here. There's no parasite removal service going on here. This is purely just pleasure seeking. At least that's how I see it. I don't know a better explanation. I spoke at a vet school in Kansas last year and one of the students came up afterwards and said, oh yeah, my dad and I go diving in the, um, in the whichever island it was. In fact, I think it's Bahamas. Uh, all the time and we see this grouper and uh, we, we pet him and I'll send you some photos. We have some photos. So she sent me these photos of them uh, interacting with this grouper fish, mugging for the camera. Here's her father putting his regulator under the grouper's uh, gill covers so that the, the bubbles uh, trickle over those gills, giving them a nice caress. I don't know if the uh, erect dorsal fin means I'm really enjoying this or not, but it might mean that. <laughs> Sharks, too, are love touch. They love uh, gentle strokes. And if you stroke a shark on the belly, don't do this at home. Uh, repeatedly, uh, they will go into a state of almost suspended animation. They're hyper relaxed. They're super chill. They're really, really comfortable. And you can see uh, show off divers who are balancing a shark, a big shark on the, on the tip of their hand um, and doing this sort of thing. And it happens in captive aquariums as well, where you, there's a video on YouTube of uh, somebody who's cleaning the tank window and this uh, leopard shark, and uh, zebra shark, I think it is, maybe the same thing, swims over and the, the cleaner start, the, um, the diver starts rubbing the shark's belly and, the, and really rigorously, and the shark he clearly loves it. And it sends these sharks into a state of uh, deep relaxation, as I say. And in that state, you can do a good deed to a, a shark, uh, because many sharks are swimming around with large fishing hooks buried in their mouths. Uh, this blue shark being an example that may have been in, that, in there for weeks, and this is not the kind of hook you can remove with a, a little pliers. You need a bolt cutters for those. And these divers go down with these tools and they remove these hooks. And uh, uh, Teresa, a friend of mine who took the photo, said that they removed, they, they cut that, that uh, hook after, out of this uh, mouth uh, about five minutes after this photo was taken. And the blue shark remained among them for quite a while. There's anecdotal accounts of whales showing gratitude and being, and being happy about having fishing nets removed from them. And you can watch videos of that as well. Um, we shouldn't assume that a shark cannot show gratitude for a, a deed, a, a favorable deed like that. <clears throat> and it feels good for us too, and we can thank them afterwards. So I want to finish up by just talking a little bit about the bigger picture, about our relationship with fishes. Um, I've tried to convince you that these are a group of animals that are uh, complex, that they can do things that we may not have been aware they could do, and that's really a growing pattern. When we look closely, we find that animals are capable of doing things that we didn't give them credit for before. And I believe that sentience is the bedrock of ethics, the reason we have a sense of right and wrong, the reason that we think we can do a good deed or a, a bad deed, why we have a sense of justice, is because others have lives that matter to them, intrinsic value. And we really haven't recognized fishes as having values, lives of value to them. Uh, but what we know scientifically is that they are individuals with biographies, not just with biologies. And uh, we, we kill such huge numbers of them, and it's very indiscriminate, and the methods are very cruel. This is actually a shrimping net from Mozambique, and uh, you'll have to look pretty hard to find any shrimp in there. There's two or three, but most of it is fishes, which we collectively call bycatch, which uh, are tossed back into the ocean, dead or dying, and uh, just thrown away. It's a very wasteful industry. The amount of bycatch we produce is about 100 million kilos a day. And its uh, fishing industry is also not very human friendly. There's a lot of slavery, um, human slave labor going on in certain fishing vessels in some parts of the world. Uh, people who are underage, uh, people who are essentially trapped on these boats for months at a time and they're not paid. And uh, they live in uh, squalid, uh, slave-like conditions. You may have heard of aquaculture. It's the fastest growing uh, mode of uh, animal ag agriculture in, over the last couple of decades in the world. And um, it has a number of problems as well. Many people think that aquaculture is a plus because it, it relieves uh, the pressure on wild populations because we're no longer fishing them in the wild. Well, uh, the animals that humans like to eat, the fishes are predatory fishes, trouts and salmon and tilapia and that sort of thing. They're fairly high on the food chain. And how do they, what do they eat? They eat other fishes and most of the food fed to them is wild caught fishes such as herrings and menhaden and sardines. And so it doesn't really relieve pressure from the wild populations. There's also a number of other problems I mentioned earlier, the crowding, the stress for the fishes themselves, but also the crowding encourages parasites and uh, pathogens that flourish in these crowded conditions just like factory farms on land. 
And so the, the fish farmers use antibiotics, they use uh, pesticides, and the nets may hold the fishes in, but the nets don't hold these other things. So fish waste, pesticides, antibiotics uh, leaches out into the surrounding water and affects other fishes out there in the wild. Nets get torn by hungry seals and other things, and so some of these fishes also escape. Sadly, they usually don't have any clue about how to survive in the wild because they've never lived in the wild and don't know the ropes. Fishes have to learn how to survive uh, just like other animals do. So they either perish or they may actually breed with some of the wild ones and, uh, and dilute their genetic rigor by, uh, by breeding that way. You've heard of shark finning, it's a, it's a huge problem, but there's a lot of effective campaigning. The efforts of, uh, of various groups around the world are helping to draw attention to this. And um, humankind has, has shown its, its capacity to, to do the right thing and uh, if we put our minds to it. We've, it's estimated that we've lost about half of all marine life over the last half century and since 1970, and we'd already lost a lot since uh, before 1970. So we're really on a very bad trend. You may have heard people predict that uh, we, if at the current rate, uh, we will uh, have no fishes left in the ocean in 2050. It's not that we're probably going to get to that point because things would be far too dire for us to continue on that path. But at some point, we have to turn the corner and we have to start making it a better world for fishes because we are we are dependent on ocean life. Um, with climate change and acidification levels going up in the oceans, we're seeing coral bleaching. Uh, we have uh, the proliferation of microplastics, uh, a byproduct of plastic manufacturing when you have tiny beads that look like fish eggs and baby fishes eat them and die from that. And so they're a major pollution problem, as is discarded fishing gear, that it's, of which about 680,000 tons are left in the oceans every year. And a lot of it continues to wreak havoc, catching marine animals and catching other fishes as well. And the planet is a fragile one, and uh, one of the most important chemicals on the planet is uh, oxygen, and uh, the oceans actually produce more than half of all oxygen, so we're really dependent ourselves on this. This is not just being friendly to fishes to try to improve our relations, it's also uh, looking out for our own uh, health and well-being and future. This is a NASA image that um, graphically illustrates just how little water there is on the planet. Three quarters of the gl globe is covered in water, but it's a very thin layer, and if you put it all into one little bead of water, it's actually very small, and 99% of that is salt water, which is not drinkable for terrestrial animals at least. So if you took a little one hundredth of that, it would be a very tiny amount of water indeed. It just reminds us how fragile the planet is and how we depend on it. I show this slide simply to illustrate how we are very adept at compartmentalizing animals into different categories. These are two mammals, essentially, while they're different species, they are essentially the same in all the important ways. They can feel, they have memories, they have emotions, they can feel pain, they can feel pleasure, they can enjoy life or not enjoy life depending on their situation. And their situation varies greatly depending on just where in the world we are. So in most of uh, Western countries, this animal <coughs> is viewed as a, a source of food. And, um, but in some countries in the world, this animal is revered as a, a sacred symbol uh, and left alone, or relatively speaking. Uh, in some parts of the world, this animal is seen as a beloved companion animal, as uh, several individuals in this room illustrate. And uh, yet there are some places where they're caged and cruelly slaughtered to be eaten. And so we're very uh, fickle about how we, <coughs> how we treat animals. And fishes have had a particularly tough time because until recently, before the development of scuba gear and underwater photography, they've been really out of our consciousness. They've been below the surface of our awareness, uh, metaphorically and, and literally speaking. Uh, they also fail to trigger some of our sympathies. Uh, we don't hear their, the sounds they make. They actually make a lot of sounds. Thank you for demonstrating sound. I appreciate that. <laughs> that was not a fish sound. That was, a, that was an anthropogenic noise. Um, but they do make a lot of sounds, and some fishes are actually named for the sounds they make, gr gr grunts and drums, for example. But these sounds evolved, were, were evolved to make, be made underwater, and we don't really hear them any more than the, we can hear each other if we stick our head under the water and shout. Um, and those eyes, those staring eyes that look feelingless, are in fact uh, served by three pairs of muscles, the same muscles that we have. They can swivel, and if you watch fishes up close, really watch them closely, you see their eyes moving around. They are taking it in, they're looking, they're gazing, they're glancing. And they don't blink, well they don't need to blink. They, they're bathed permanently in water. We blink to keep our eyes moist. Their eyes are always moist, so they simply don't have to have that. But if we look 
and probe into their lives the way creative scientists can allow us to do, to see that they feel pain, to see that they have emotions, to recognize that they recognize us, to see how they can be happy when we get home, and to see that uh, they can be virtuous, and they can communicate referentially, and they can remember and keep accounts, and they can have grudges, and all these things that they can do. Science can show that, and I don't mean to say that science is the be-all, end-all. Science has, is flawed, but science does allow us to see things and to see animals as capable of things that if we didn't have science, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to tell. And the accumulation of what we now know about fishes, to me, means we need a whole new relationship with them. We need to view them in a, in a w different way. I've become convinced that fishes are uh, deserving equal consideration to all the other vertebrate animals on Earth uh, based on what we know about them. And I want to finish with just a, a brief story about a relationship that a, a woman in Florida had with Jasper, who was her discus fish. This is a, a kind of very attractive fish of various color types of colors that people keep in aquariums. And like Mango earlier, Jasper uh, lived alone. And uh, he probably would get a bit lonely when she was away for the day. And uh, when she got home, they would play a little game where, where she would run back and forth in front of the tank. And Jasper would swim with her. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you, that was scary. I forgot about the dogs, but at least I woke them up. I was getting resentful of them sleeping through my talk, so no. Anyway, she would run back and forth, and, um, and Jasper would swim with her, and this is something that other people have described. And then she would um, take her hands and cup them like this, and lower them into the water, and the water would fill her hands, and Jasper would swim onto his side and swim into her cupped hands and she could stroke, stroke him like that. So it was the same kind of behavior you saw of the grouper earlier. This is a, an animal who's connecting with a human uh, in the way of pleasure, pleasure of touch. Which, by the way, I've thought about writing a book about because touch is such an important uh, way of, that animals communicate with each other. And for me, that relationship is symbolic of where we could be with fishes. We could be, we don't have to be hooking them and netting them and pulling them out of their homes and making them suffocate or, or crush or, or die from uh, decompression or loss of blood and all the nasty ways they die when we treat them the way we so often do. Uh, we can actually have much better relationships with, with these creatures and often that means just respecting them from afar and letting them live in their habitats. We can go and watch them and you can watch great YouTube videos of people swimming and diving and filming them in coral reefs and it's such a beautiful environment down there. It's like another world. And so um, that's really the, the central message uh, of my work on fishes is, is that they have rich lives, they have lives that are deserving of respect, and that we can do much better. Humans have shown ourselves to do much better. We've done away with colonialism, institutionalized slavery, with few rare exceptions, um, the civil rights movement, and um, the votes for women, those are four examples of huge sweeping cultural changes that we've made in fairly short periods of decades or centuries, which in the historical time is very short. So we can do better by them. And um, I like what uh, the American biologist Sylvia Earle said, that we can translate that into our individual relationships with, with these creatures. She's like the Jane Goodall of the oceans. And if we do that, it's karma as well. It'll be a better world for us. I do believe that what's good uh, leads to other good behavior and what's, what goes around comes around. So if we're more compassionate to fishes, it's a more compassionate society and it's a better one to live in. That's a society I'd like to live in. So I hope you'll join me in doing that. Thanks for listening. I'll take questions. Start off with a question. Uh, we once posted a, a video, YouTube video, on our Facebook channel. Uh, it was showing human and fish interaction, and actually a human stroking a fish. And we got some negative comments saying uh, humans shouldn't interact with fishes in that way. Um, would you say it's always a good thing, or should we, like, as lay people, try to stay away from fishes? Or what's, what's your take on that? 
Yeah, my take is that is that you know, we should we should be we can be flexible about that sort of thing. And while uh, interfering with wild animals isn't always a good idea, I think there are exceptions, especially if it's a situation where the fish may willingly approach the person to be stroked. Um, it appears to be pleasurable. They enjoy it. They can remove themselves from that situation anytime. And we have so much to improve in our relations with that kind of animal. And if people see that, they may see them in a different light. Those are all reasons why I think uh, you can deflect the criticism. Have the Italians really made um, laws about not keeping a, a single fish, like a goldfish, in a bowl by itself? Yeah, I haven't done any follow-up research, but I do remember reading that uh, the, the uh, ministers in Rome had passed a law some years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, uh, in which it was stated that you may not keep a, a goldfish, or probably any fish for that matter, uh, but certainly a social animal in a barren goldfish bowl. I mean, it's almost a, it's almost a, a symbol, isn't it? We've seen that, that goldfish bowl, and it's used in advertising and this sort of thing. Well, it's against the law in, in Rome. And I think also the, the, I think it may be Swiss law, Gruppentier law, the group animal law that was passed some years ago, also stipulates that Animals who live in groups, including fishes, um, should not be kept alone. They need to be kept in groups. So I think that you would be totally opposed to aquaria, to anybody keeping Yeah, well, it's complicated. I mean, I, I would like to see that fade away. I mean, uh, people do keep fishes in aquarium. It's the number one most common pet animal in the United States, I believe, so a lot of animals in aquaria. Yeah, there's a lot of hidden ills with that, such as how the, how the animal's collected. You know, when you go in pet shops, I, I never get a good feeling when I go in pet shops and I see these animals languishing in small containers, small tanks, or small cages. Uh, and uh, st studies show, statistical uh, analyses show that uh, a lot of these animals are collected in the wild and the collection methods are often cruel and, and pretty violent, such as using explosives, using poisons. And uh, the mortality rate, the death rate, is about 90% from collection to arrival at destination because many of these fishes are shipped around the world, especially to the United States where I live, which is the number one consumer of this product. And so uh, you got 90% mortality rate over the first part of their life when they go ship, when they're shipped, and then within a year, 90% of them are no longer living either. They die in the tanks because well-meaning people or not so well-meaning people don't know how to look after them. Consider the royal blue tang, the star of um, Finding Dory. This is a fish who in the wild lives anywhere from two to 50 meters deep. How many tanks do you know in people's homes that are you know, 30 meters deep, which is the kind of water pressure they like? So there's so many needs that they have that we're not likely to meet. So yeah, I take a pretty dim view of aquariums, and we really should move away from that. Yes? This is probably more directed scientifically, but um, recently I've spent quite a bit of time in the Barrier Reef in amongst all the bleached corals, and I'm completely intrigued about all those coloured fish, you know, and all the colours they are for being mm. the coral. And what an amazing stress it must be that they're losing their habitat like that. And I just sort of wonder, I mean, is there a special study being done? Because that's like enormous populations of fish that lose their habitat right. and, and, and or can they change colour? Are they all going to go white? I mean, see yes. these angelfish and you go like, they, they, you know, and you just sort of, they're still swimming amongst it and you just, I don't know, you just think they're so vulnerable to all the prey. Yeah, I, I actually don't know of any research that's being done on that, although I, I bet there is some because it's a widespread problem. And how is it affecting? It certainly has got to affect the camouflage yeah. of fishes who are living on that on that habitat. Are they moving to other locations? Are the corals adapting? There is at least one example of formerly bleached coral that is recovering now. So, uh, you know, this stuff is not irreversible. It can it can come back if we get our act together. But it's a very difficult problem because these are global phenomena. It can be activities that are happening on another continent that are affecting corals somewhere else. So. Uh, I'm encouraged by the growth in the number of sanctuaries, of ocean sanctuaries that are lands that are being protected. It's still a, a small fraction, um, but at least it's a trend that's increasing in the Antarctic um, and some of the islands uh, that, that are out there. There's, there's big zones, protect, no fishing zones. Also, Indonesia is um, blowing up uh, so-called poaching vessels. 
in my mind, it's all poaching, but uh, from the fish's perspective. But um, if they identify a poaching vessel, they remove the humans from the boat and uh, extradite them, and then they bl ex blow up the, the boat. And you can watch YouTube videos of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> you can sort of, you know, depending on your mood, you can say, yeah. <laughs> yes? Follow up on the aquarium question. Uh, yes. How about boredom? And how, 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 large, how large is the habitat of the goldfish? And, uh, right. How large should the aquarium be so the fish doesn't get bored? Yeah, we, we now know from things like play behavior, for instance, that it looks like a fish can get bored. I mean, a fish wants to play or wants to do something stimulating. It's, it supports the idea that a fish can become bored. And that's one of those intangibles that's not even usually included in the equation of whether we should keep fishes in aquaria or not. Consider that a goldfish can live to 40 plus years, so they're very long-lived animals. And um, so often tanks have very little in them. It doesn't change, there's nothing growing. It can change. Somebody who's, who's conscientious could actually move the rocks around, put other objects in, and I would encourage anyone who has fish for the time being to do that, to stimulate them, give them stimulation. And this is a widespread, well known, that enrichment is the, is the catch term that scientists use. Uh, enrichment is a very important way to improve the quality of life of captive animals. Let's face it, confinement is a huge penalty. We use it to put prisoners, criminals, in, in jail. We know that it's a bad penalty for us, and yet we blithely do it to other species. So boredom is a problem, and we can take steps to relieve boredom as long as we're still keeping them in captivity. Yes. Yes. You sort of touched on um, where you draw the line in pencil. You mentioned that. Where do you draw the line? You know, <laughs> sort of I mean, some well, people say like bacteria, plants, right. you know, insects, etc. Well, last week I was drawing it here, and yeah. now this week I'm drawing it, yeah. I mean, some of you may have seen the, the, the number one best-selling book, The Hidden Life of Trees, by, by a German national, Peter Wolleib, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to tell you that his next book is called The, the Inner Life of Animals. So he's, uh, he's actually uh, writing about animals now, and in a similar style, a very sort of open, um, not, not um, the kind of reluctance that science has to sort of make, a, make a, in conclusions about trees or, or animals. He's, he's quite open about just making these conclusions. And so I hope that book will do some good. I expect it'll be widely read because he's because of his notoriety. Um, uh, back to your question. Yeah, where to draw the line? Um, I, I just it's 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 what's important to me is that we is that we be aware of what the science is showing, and you can't expect scientists to do that. So we need journalists and writers and other people to bring this to keep this stuff up to date. And um, but where there's doubt, to try to give the benefit of the doubt to the to the one who loses the most if we're wrong. So um, you know the animal who may be suffering, and we think they were, when they're not suffering, we should um, include them in our circle of moral concern uh, because it's 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 important that they be protected if we are not sure if they're sentient. That wasn't very eloquent, but uh, give them the benefit of the doubt is a principle I think is an important one. Can I answer that question because um, I'm thinking about the stroking, which I find really very remarkable. Um, have there been studies, well, first of all, why do they like it? I mean, they don't stroke each other, right? It's like this Martian coming and stroking them. It's like they never thought of this, suddenly there's a human there. Maybe, is there any difference, like maybe the fish that are sort of solitary or in a you know, coral kind of environment, or like the swarm fish? I mean, the swarming fish, lots of them together, do they do that all the time anyway? Right. Sort of subconsciously, any studies on that? Well, they do actually touch each other. I mean, the courting, courtship behavior often involves touch, so there may be a, an association of touch with sex or, or some other positive aspect of life. Um, also, the cleaner-client relations that uh, where the, the cleaners will actually, well, first of all, they're, they are touching the clients to remove parasites. Who knows whether a fish can get a little feeling of pleasure to have a parasite removed? You know, maybe like a, almost a satisfying, like brief bit of pain. It's like a good pain. It's like, oh, finally got that louse off of me. Who knows? But the fact that they do stroke them as well. What I love about that phenomenon, the caressing, is that it's the fish is doing it to each other, and it's no has no immediate benefit in terms of 
survival, which so often scientists measure it all in terms of survival and reproductive advantage and competition and all this kind of thing. Um, this is a sort of a, almost, almost a gratuitous, we don't like to say gratuitous in science because everything an animal does must have a purpose. And indeed, I think there's a purpose here, but the purpose is not about survival or making my whole quality of my genes better or having more genetic success. It's, it's, it's a social purpose. It's to impress or to, to create a good feeling, goodwill, if you like, so that the future interactions will be more favorable. So all those reasons, to me, um, say that this stroking is a very, and, and the touch, the pleasure of touch, is a very natural part of a fish's life history. Maybe not all fishes, but a lot of fishes are, they do touch each other. I was just snorkeling in um, off Florida, where I live, uh, two weeks ago, and there were two nurse sharks along the bottom. And, you know, I, I explored 600 meters of, of, of ocean that day, and I only saw two nurse sharks, and they were right together, touching each other. They could have been in, apart, but they're social. They hung out together. You know why? We can have many theories about that. Uh, but, but animals like to be, often like to be in each other's company, and touch, I think, is an important part of that. Um, you mentioned YouTube a couple of times. And, mentioned uh, you what? Said YouTube. You mentioned yes. YouTube a couple many of times. Many times, yes. Big fan. You mentioned scuba diving and... Um, well, the possibility to actually go and see the animals uh, also. And I also noticed myself that zoos are not that hot anymore. You know, first they, first they were just very bleak, now they make them better, but still people are not really satisfied with how our animals are kept. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a connection between um, internet media, tourism, and this shift in opinion? Yeah, I couldn't say. It's a very interesting thesis, and it could be studied. And I would think with, a lot, with the amount of human-animal studies work that's going on these days, um, somebody somewhere is probably addressing that. Uh, I think just a general question that, uh, that would be of great interest to me is what kind of influence is the Internet having on our perception of animals? And the Internet, you know, it's a good and bad, right? There's a lot of bad stuff out there and misinformation. but. It's, it's really empowering to be able to tell someone, you know, who's, who's sort of saying, oh, you know, they, they slaughter them humanely. They, they treat them all right in those farms. It's okay. I know they have rules to protect them. You can point to someone. You can send them the link to a YouTube video that shows them otherwise. Or another website, you know, Meet Your Meat or whatever video it is. Ones that I, I won't watch anymore. I've seen enough of it and I feel like I don't need to watch it. But I'm glad they're there. We need to have that, that information. So, and the, and the other side of it, you can watch fishes stroking each other. You can watch uh, these kinds Kind of phenomena. You can watch a whale showing what looks to be gratitude for being rescued from a, a net. You can watch all this. You can see it yourself any time, any day. That's very po powerful to me, and I think that's a force for good. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that if and when I read about a study to see is, is the internet influencing how we view animals, we're seeing an improvement. Very hard to say if it's because of the internet, but nevertheless, I think it probably is. Um. You mentioned uh, this uh, fish species uh, which doesn't develop eyes anymore if it's... Uh, right, the blind cave fish, yeah. yes. In, in what amount of time are they developed back? I don't know. All I know is that if you put fry, baby fishes of that species, in a lighted environment, as they grow, they look any other fish like their eyes develop normally. So it's not that you take that one who was blind and put them in the light and then they'll develop eyes. They're going to be blind for their entire life. It's just during development the eye will be expressed if they're in a lighted situation. So the light itself is the stimulus that triggers that that development of the eye. And thank you very much, uh, John Falcom, for being here. Thank you for a very...